all stand together and let's sing number 626, The Lily of the Valley. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church tonight. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. You may be seated. Good to see you tonight. I'm glad that you're with us uh, as we end the Lord's Day in the Lord's house together. Thank you e each for being here. Uh, I've, I shared this morning uh, that I heard from, and it's actually Dr. Charles Goodman. He's, a, uh, he's an instructor down at Clear Creek uh, Baptist Bible College in Pineville, and he, he's, he's an interim pastor uh, at a church uh, in Kingsport, uh, Tennessee, I think. Yeah, but he was talking about those uh, two groups he knows, one from Kentucky, a Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Group, and then a, a similar group from Tennessee, that between those two groups, they led 45 people to Christ uh, through the course of ministering to them uh, as they helped them uh, mud out their homes and different things there in eastern Kentucky. Well, we've been sending, uh, we've been sending support financially, uh, physically, uh, materials, um, from our church and from our community. I know Brother Danny Ford took, uh, 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 Ford Brothers received a bunch of materials and, and he made a trip out there to Gospel Light Baptist Church in, in uh, Hazard, uh, Kentucky, Perry County. And, uh, and we also sent a, a, a love offering, a, an initial love offering to them. And uh, Darren Allen has been boots on the ground there doing work with them. And then last Sunday we took up an offering. I'll give you the numbers on that. Kevin and I have been talking back and forth today. We as a church uh, took up uh, on Sunday, and people who gave leading up to that, we took up uh, $5,460 for that on top of what we've already sent them, which was $2,600. And then two different organizations had given us money uh, for, uh, for that offering too. So a total of $7,640 that we're going to send to Gospel Light Baptist Church tomorrow morning in the mail. I was talking, I was trading texts with Chris, a brother Fugit, a brother Chris Fugit, the pastor there, right before I came in. And he told me this, that through all of this, and through their ministering to people you know, in their need, uh, 20 people have come to know Christ and 13 of those people have been baptized. So let's give a round of applause for that. I mean, that is awesome. That's, that's, that's 65 people that I've learned about who have trusted Christ through all this. Amen? And that's, that's what you pray for, and that's what you hope for, and we're, and we're thankful uh, to God for that. So I wanted to give you all uh, that update. Uh, yeah, grab a bulletin. Uh, if you haven't already, just make sure you look through it. The, uh, there's information about Sunday school that's coming up. I, I will say this about the, that membership class. There's a sign-up sheet for that back there, I think. It's, it's close, uh, close to pulling that because I, I don't want more than eight because of the space that we have back there. And I think we're really close to that number 
uh, right now. There's an Operation Christmas Child event. There's a lady seminar both in September and uh, make, you, uh, make you aware of that. And also make you aware of uh, our homecoming revival. It's been uh, listed in the bulletin for a long time, uh, but this, it's coming up really soon. There's these little postcards out there. I, I encourage you to grab one for your own benefit, but more than anything, to hand it out. Uh, invite people, use it to invite people to our homecoming. So it's going to be uh, Friday the 23rd through Sunday the 25th. Friday night and Saturday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to have services right here. And then Sunday we'll have our, our, our normal uh, homecoming schedule. <clears throat> so excuse me. Tyler Prater, who, who he, he preached the last revival meeting that we had before COVID uh, and did a fantastic job, young pastor from um, uh, the uh, Fellowship Baptist Church in Liberal, Kansas, uh, out there in West Kansas. He's going to be back with us again. His wife, Jenny Lee. Jenny Lee or Jenny Lynn? Jenny Lynn. I always forget the end. Jenny Lynn's going to be uh, with him this time, and, and that, that will be a great blessing uh, as well. But on, on, on Friday night, our choir's going to be singing. We'll have special music as well. On Saturday night at 7 o'clock, we'll have a little bit different when it comes to music. His Heart Quartet will sing uh, an, an abbreviated um, you know, abbreviated from what they would normally do. Uh, it'd be a typical, maybe just a little bit longer than regular song service. And then Tyler will preach, Brother Tyler will preach after that. And then on Sunday, 10 a.m., during our, during our Sunday school hour, my brother's keeper, the Gospel Bluegrass group, who have been here before, they will sing in here Sunday at 10 a.m. Then uh, we'll have our service at 11, and then our meal, and, and that, will be, that will be it. But that's that's coming up, the 23rd, the 24th, and 25th. And I want you to do everything you can to be a part of all those services. You don't want to miss out and, and invite people, use these, and if we need to make more, we'll make more. So I want to make you uh, aware of that. Pray for the Rivas family. Uh, pray for the Irwin family. Uh, Brother Rivas went home to be with the Lord yesterday. Uh, it looks like Alex's granddad is not long for this world. And we've got quite a few in our own number who are sick and not well. And we need to hold them up before the Lord as well. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer uh, before we continue on uh, with our song service. Stephen Renner, I, I know I just asked you to pray back in our meeting, but why don't you go ahead and lead us again in prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to be able to gather in your house. God, we do all the prayer requests. God, let's meet each of those needs that you see best fit. God, be with us as we gather for your word tonight. Be with Brother Travis, be with the Lord's time to speak. Be with us this week as we go out and serve you in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing number 690, He Leadeth Me.
Amen. You may be seated. You can find the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel uh, when, you get, uh, when you get settled. Uh, we're going to look through chapters 9 and 10. We're walking on Sunday nights through the life of Samuel, learning, uh, learning lessons from the life of King Saul from the book of Samuel. And um, last week, or not last week, but two weeks ago, we talked about how the people wanted a king. And if you remember, it wasn't a bad thing that they wanted a king. Uh, God had prepared them for me all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Actually, going all the way back to Genesis 49, when Jacob blessed his 12 sons, he made it clear in his blessing on Judah that the scepter would not depart from the tribe of Judah, that, that there was going to be that there was going to be a king, and it would come from the tribe of Judah eventually. And then in Deuteronomy, there was uh, restrictions and guidance for kings. A king was supposed to write down a copy of the law. A king was not supposed to accumulate uh, a big standing army and a bunch of horses, which, which had to do with a uh, mechanized army, if you want to think about that, and a bunch of wives. So it wasn't that the king was an issue. It was that the people wanted a king for the wrong reasons. They wanted a king who would go out and fight their battles, uh, be their protection. They wanted a king of their own choosing and rejected God from being their king. And God gave them their desire. Be careful what you ask God for, because he'll give you what you desire. And sometimes uh, that is discipline more than that is a blessing. And so in their rebellion against God, the Israelites had asked for a king, and God had given them their request, and it was a form of discipline more than it was a form of blessing. And that's what we learned in 1 Samuel 8. But in chapters 9 and 10, we learned that uh, the, the people's choice of a king, you could put it that way. And these chapters actually introduce us. We weren't introduced to Saul yet. These chapters introduce us to Saul, the man who would be king. And chapter 9 tells us of Saul's natural talents for leadership, and then chapter 10 talks about his supernatural uh, giftings uh, for leadership and what we can learn from that. I'm not going to read both chapters. So you can breathe easy if you're thinking I'm going to do that. I'm not going to read uh, 50, uh, uh, four verses here. We'll, we'll, we'll work our way through them together. But what I want us to see from the very start is uh, we begin as the Bible begins by looking at the man of Saul and his natural positive qualities that, uh, that made the people of Israel desire him uh, to be a king. God doesn't always bypass our human humanity. God uses uh, our natural human qualities. As a matter of fact, you can write this down if you want to. I'm, I'm not going to have you turn there, but Psalm 139 tells us that uh, he has prepared us uh, for the job he has to do, e even our genetic structure has a, has, a play, uh, has a place in that. So Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 says, Thou hast possessed my reins. That, that's a King James way of talking about my, my innermost being. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderly, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your, are your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from you. I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members, talking about physical members, were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them, when uh, they hadn't been you know, brought to full uh, fruition yet. So our, our genetic structure, the way we are made physically, even that is ordained of God and used by God. He creates us. Each one of us are unique in that regard. He creates us with particular features and characteristics and places us where he wants us according to his divine uh, purpose and will. Uh, I, I like to say, and I've learned this, everything I share, I've learned from other people, that the best place to serve God is right where he sets you down. And the best place to, uh, to be used of God is with what he's given you you know, don't waste your time wishing you were like somebody else, okay? Oh, I wish I, I, wish, I, wish I was more like that person. Uh, uh, I wish I had that person's and then fill in the blank. Don't, don't do that. You know, maybe you can see an example that you want to follow, absolutely. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Maybe you can see a certain level of, uh, of drive or achievement or ability that you want to develop. 
and you want that person to help you into developing it? Absolutely. But don't be Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I haven't seen where he said this, but this is according to legend. Theodore Roosevelt said that uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And I agree with that, whether, he, whether TR said it or not, I, I agree with the statement. You know, if you're constantly comparing yourself with other people, you're going to be robbed of joy. Just use what God has given you and continue to develop that. And we're looking at that with King Saul you know, right now. So what, what we see about Saul would make him useful in leading a nation. Well, let's just start off uh, with verse 1. We're kind of, I kind of walked through it that way tonight. Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharoth, the son of Ahipha, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. That's a King James way of saying a mighty man of strength. Let's kind of interrupt our, thro- our flow of thought for a second. Now, this is obviously, remember from what we talked about two weeks ago, Judges 17 and Judges 21 says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes and there was no king of Israel. So this is a transition point and before the first king is anointed. And so so what, is, what is the period of time in Israelite history that we're transitioning from? The period of the who? The period of the judges. That's exactly right. And that was a, that, those were dark days, as, as I just quoted from Judges 17 and Judges 21. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And if you read through, if you've read through the book of Judges, and here's one of the benefits of following a plan that takes you through the entire Bible in a year or a year and a half or two years, however long it takes you. When you read through the entire Bible, you obviously read it all. And you might not read all of Judges. You might read about Samson, and you might read about uh, uh, Japheth's uh, rash vow, and you might read about Gideon, but you might not read all 21 chapters of Judges if you don't have a plan that would take you through it all. And when you read all 21 chapters of Judges, you find out, starting around chapter 16, 17, I forget exactly where, it really gets dark. It really gets dark. And the tribe of Benjamin plays a role in that. I won't go through all of that for the sake of time, and you can have something to do this week. But uh, a, a Levite went through uh, and stayed in, in one of Benjam, Benjamin's villages, and uh, some very immoral men wanted to do that man harm, kind of similar to what we read about in Sodom, and instead they, they brutalized one of, uh, his, uh, the, the concubine that he had traveling with him. And that led to the other 11 tribes they were so distraught at what happened that those other 11 tribes went to the tribal leaders of Benjamin and said, you give up this town, they're going to face discipline, and if you don't, we're coming after the whole tribe. And basically the tribe of Benjamin said, well, bring it on. And there was civil war in, in Israel. Um, every man did that which was right in his own eye. And it cost a lot of lives on both sides, but eventually the other 11 tribes, as you would expect, almost wiped out Benjamin, almost. There weren't many left. And so it's interesting, I'm just, we're getting to this, Benjamin has had some time perhaps to to, uh, recover some, and I'm telling you this because a little bit later, Saul will say, he shows some humility, he goes, why on earth would I be uh, anointed king of God's people? I'm, uh, I'm the least in my family, and we're the least tribe in Israel. That's one of the reasons, because we can think of it from a New Testament perspective and know that Saul was from Benjamin and know that Jerusalem was in the tribal allotment to Benjamin. And we can think to ourselves, well, you know, Benjamin, Benjamin stayed with Judah when the kingdom split. And we, can, and we can think to ourselves, well, Benjamin, that was one of the impressive tribes. They were a good tribe. Well, during this setting, during this time, they were, they were the least of the tribes in Israel because of the history, because of what had been going on there. And yet, we see that uh, from that tribe, Kish, uh, Saul's dad, he had gained some, uh, some wealth and some status and some strength, and Benjamin uh, was a man you know, in that house. The Hebrew word for power refers to strength, it refers to wealth, and that's exactly what this family was enjoying. So, so Saul, Saul come from a wealthy family, and that had a potential to be advantage to, to him and the kingdom. 
you know, we shouldn't think, I don't, I don't know that anybody necessarily in our church does, but you can have people who think that they, they can automatically equate poor with righteousness and wealth with unrighteousness. That's a false metric. Amen? It, that, that has nothing to do with righteousness and unrighteousness. Uh, uh, poor people can be just as covetous as rich people, and rich people can be more humble and, and, and generous than a poor person uh, uh, would be. It's, what you, it's how you use what God has given you. That is, uh, that is the key. But having resources, whatever they are, whether they're physical resources or material resources, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just how it's used and why you, why you use it. The motivation. Look at verse 2. We're still talking about uh, Saul's genes, if you will, and not his Levi's, but his natural abilities, natural talents, natural uh, uh, resources. And he had a son, we're talking about Kish, whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly man. And there is not among the children of Israel goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than than any of the people. He was literally head and shoulders above uh, the, the rest of Benjamin, for sure, and in, in, in his own family. He was a physically attractive guy. That's what it means, that he was goodly. He was handsome and, and easy on the eyes. He was taller and, and, and most likely broader than the other folks. He was head and shoulders uh, higher than the rest of the people in his family and in his tribe, and maybe Israel in general. And obviously, this is kind of superficial and shallow on one level. But you also have to recognize the times and the culture. So in the ancient Middle East, height was very important. And you also have to consider, uh, it's not uncommon uh, for folks to be you know, six foot, six one now. You know, you know, people wouldn't think of six foot or six one you know, being tall. Yeah, but... But in this day, and a lot of it has to do with the nutrition that is available to us, we take, we, we take things for granted. It is so rich uh, the way we eat. Last night, uh, Luke and I had uh, uh, some mahi-mahi fillets and uh, some black beans and some rice and, uh, and some uh, broccoli. And that, that is a meal for a king not too long ago. You know, but we just go down to Kroger's and we get the materials and there we go. You know, we, we are so blessed. Uh, it, it, it wasn't that long ago where, uh, uh, you know, some bread and cheese would be a meal. Uh, and if you had a little fat back to throw in there, really good, right? And, 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 and that's what you had. And, and, but uh, but in, in, in Saul's day especially, to be tall was unique. It, it wasn't something that was common like a, like a lot of others. And so they, uh, tall people were respected and admired, whether they should have been or not, but just because of their, uh, of their own height. And um, again, it's easy for people who are vertically challenged to uh, uh, look down, uh, metaphorically speaking, on people who are tall. And it's, uh, it's, it's easy for people who are tall to look down on people who are smaller. That, that shouldn't happen. But we recognize that Saul was recognized. He literally stood head and shoulders above the rest. He was a good-looking guy, and that stood him apart. Uh, um, wh whether that was a, a good thing or not, it was, it was the case. And his physical, appearance, his physical appearance was to his advantage, humanly speaking. Now, according to verse 3, let's get to something that's a little more substantial. That's Saul's genes. But let's get to something a little more substantial and talk about his conduct. So verse 3 says, of 1 Samuel 9, and the asses, the, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, and Kish said to Saul, his son, remember this son who's a good-looking, head and shoulders above the rest, take now one of the servants, arise, go and seek the asses. So, and that's exactly what he does. Lost donkeys can seem like a waste of time for some of us, especially for a, a, a wealthy family, but uh, Kish didn't just send uh, the servants out for this. He sent Saul, one of his sons, to lead this expedition, this quest. And Saul was obedient to do that. Kind of reminds me of another farmer's son who was obedient to tend the sheep. And when dad said, take, this, take these box lunches to your older brothers who are serving with the army, and by the way, take a special gift of some cheeses to their captain, you go and do that. That's exactly what he did. I'm talking about David. And, and, and 
David show was obedient to his father, and that's exactly what we see from Saul. There was no hint of rebellion. There was no hint of resentment. We just read that Kish had lost his donkeys, and he sent Saul to go get them, and Saul did. Little did Saul realize that as he obeyed his father and went looking for these lost donkeys, that he would meet Samuel. Samuel, the prophet and judge, who would be led by God to anoint Saul to be the first king of Israel. This, don't get in your mind, just like we shouldn't get in our mind where we should compare ourselves to others. Comparison is the thief of joy. Here, here is another thing that is completely wrong for us to do, to pick and to choose where we should obey. I, 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 I want to obey in the, in the big issues. I want to obey in, in, the, in the mighty high visibility things, but not so much in the small things that uh, might not seem as important or might not get as much notice. That, that's, that's the wrong way to think. That's the wrong way to carry yourself. And as a matter of fact, in the big things, we won't be faithful and be obedient if we're not, if we're not obedient and faithful in the small things, right? It just won't happen. It just won't happen. If you can't be depended on when it comes to the small things, how can you be trusted when it comes to anything that's weightier? And so Saul, he's, he's stepping right out like he was told to do. And if, if you have what you think is an insignificant task to perform, do it. And do it right and do it with all your might. As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, and the chapter and verse are escaping me, but I know it's, there's 12 chapters in Ecclesiastes, and it's in the last half. Uh, whatever your hand, I think it's in chapter 7, but don't, it's in the last half. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whether therefore you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Just give yourself to it. Don't think that tasks are too insignificant for you to perform. Do it to the best that you can. And it may be that God is opening up for you a responsibility, a greater responsibility and greater privilege. But look, anything that God calls us to do, anything that we do in the service to our king is a great privilege. Saul's, Saul's conduct, he was obedient and he was also diligent. So verse four says, and he passed through Mount Ephraim and he passed through the land of uh, Shalishah, uh, but they found them not. And then they passed through the land of Shalom. And there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. Now, I don't know if this is because these donkeys were just good at hiding. I don't know if Saul couldn't find donkeys worth a hoot or whatever. I, I, you know, there's a lot of things we could say about why he can't find these donkeys. And we don't know how many. We know there's at least two. Uh, but whatever you can say, you can say that Saul, based on verse 4, was diligent. He, was, he, he, kept, he, he didn't just try a little bit and say, well, they're not here, and then go on. H have I ever told you about Maximus? I'm getting a lot of blank stares. I don't mean Maximus, Decidimus, whatever, uh, strength and honor from the Roman legion, but we've always had small dogs. We had uh, these little uh, miniature schnauzers who absolutely, uh, they loved Diana. Uh, they feared me, but they loved Diana. And we had these little miniature schnauzers. Uh, every time we'd get one, we'd call it Zeke because the first one was Zeke, and we called the second one something else officially, but I called him Zeke all the time anyway, so he was Zeke. So every miniature schnauzer we get is a salt and pepper, and we call it Zeke. I've got a little white dog. It's a little bigger now, and she's Lucy. But the kids, especially when they were little, they wanted a man's dog. And so we got this German Shepherd um, Husky mix, I think. I forget what Max. Maximus was a big dog. Maximus, when we got Maximus, um, I got him off of Craigslist. I'll never do that again. It's the first and last time I'll buy a dog on Craigslist. And as the guy who was pulling away, I mean, because it was a quick transfer, and as I, I, I open the back of the Aspen and I say, up, Maximus, and the guy's driving off. He doesn't even slow down. He won't jump in, <laughs> and he kept on driving. Red flag immediately. So I had to pick up this 80-pound dog and put him in the back of my Aspen. And then it was just, it was just rough from, uh, from the whole time we had Maximus. Maximus wouldn't go up the stairs. Yeah, I had to drag this 80-pound dog up the stairs with a leash because he was afraid to go up the stairs. When he finally did go up the stairs, he deposited a very ugly gift in, Luke's, or, or in um, Ethan's bedroom. He wanted to jump on the dinner table. When Luke brought home pizza, he jumped onto the dinner table. He could jump. 
He jumped onto the dinner table to help himself to the pizza. I was at a men's retreat, having a great time at a men's retreat, and Diana was blowing my phone up because Maximus was jumping through everything. He jumped through one of the screen doors trying to get in the house because they, they, they didn't want him in the house because he was trying to eat the pizza. And so he jumped into the screen door, which the screen was in the upper half of the door. And so this 80-pound dog has jumped. He can jump. He jumped through the screen door and was hanging on the door. And so my phone's getting blown up uh, with angry faces because the dog I brought into the house. Well, one day I'm at the office. Noah is going on a run. Uh, Noah's trying to put the leash on Maximus. Maximus runs out the door, and he calls me. I, I only lived, I, 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 the church office was only two and a half miles from the house. I leave the house. I come over, and I went, Maximus? <laughs> Maximus? And, uh, what? Well, he won't come. He must be lost. I did look, but I wasn't very diligent in my looking for Maximus, and um, we never saw him again, and I, I, I did look, but I wasn't like Saul. My conduct wasn't diligent. I didn't, I didn't run through every part of Coomer Creek development looking for Maximus. I just stood at the end of the driveway and sort of kind of called his name, and he never came. But that wasn't the case with Saul. Saul was diligent. He had a job to do, and you might have thought it was a menial task, but he attacked it with all that he had, and he was diligent. Verse 5, Saul was also, cons he was considerate. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to a servant that was with him, come, let us return, lest my father leave caring for the donkeys, the asses, and take thought of us. You know, we've been gone for so long looking for these missing donkeys that dad's going to start thinking, no, we're lost now, and he's going to send other people. So he's, he's considerate uh, of others, and he was also uh, teachable. He was teachable. So verses 6 through 10, and he said unto him, uh, behold, this is his servant. This is his servant. Remember, Saul's from a wealthy, uh, powerful family, and his servant says to him, now look, uh, there's, there's in this city a, a man of God. He's an honorable man, and that he, uh, all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let's go hither, and peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. And before time in Israel, here's a little parenthetical statement. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, uh, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For back then, what we call prophets now were called seers. Then verse 10. Then said Saul to his servant, well, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Saul was teachable. I love that. I, I, if you're not teachable, then really, what good are you going to be? If you can only do the telling. If nobody can communicate anything to you. If, if, if you can only do the telling. Then, uh, th then you're going to be very limited. And by the way, being teachable, considerate, diligent, and obedient, especially being uh, obedient, well, all four of these. I should have a fifth one up there, and that's humility. Because it requires humility to be obedient, diligent in your obedience, considerate, and teachable. And the rest of the chapter tells us that Saul uh, did indeed meet Samuel. And Samuel took Saul, and he was being, uh, Samuel was being prepared for this ahead of time. Samuel took Saul and his servant to supper, shared the best part of a big feast with them. And you see that all the while, God had been arranging the circumstances that would put Saul and Samuel in company. If you want to say that uh, God was behind the donkeys getting let loose, there is, there is a level in which that is accurate, at least to the point that God was uh, superintending even those natural events for his purposes. Yeah, don't read too much into that, because then you make God the author of evil, which he is not. But the point is that God rules and overrules in every circumstance for his glory and in, in, in the good of others. And that's exactly what happened here uh, with these lost donkeys. And Samuel being teachable with his servant and going to see Saul. God had been already speaking to Samuel about 
when and whom he would anoint to be the king of Israel because Samuel didn't know Saul. You know, they did. This was not some pre, this was not some thing that Samuel had worked out. And here's another thing why we should be obedient, diligent, considered, and teachable. Because we never know what God is doing in the hearts and minds of other people. And by the way, don't worry about that. You, you, you just follow what God's uh, uh, doing in your life and, and how he's changing you and how he's drawing you to be more obedient, more diligent, more considerate, more teachable. And you let him, you let him work in other people's lives and, 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 uh, as he sees fit. And, and you let that work itself out according to his timing. And so at sunrise the next morning, Samuel anointed Saul with oil, symbolizing that he would be the next king of Israel. So look at that. We'll look at that, verses 26 and, 20 and following. And they arose early. I'm in chapter 9 still, verse 26. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid thy servant pass on before us, and he passed on, and stand, and stand here with me for a while, and I'll show thee the word of God. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And so here uh, Samuel anointed Saul to be king, and, and it was private. It was, it was a private an anointing that uh, we see here. So that's Saul's conduct. Now let's talk about his, his giftedness. And, and I think it's legitimate to say there's a difference between talents and gifts. Talents are natural abilities that are in our genes. Uh, God gives talents from birth. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit on Sunday mornings, especially when, when we went through Romans 12, 1 through 8. We took about four weeks to go through those eight verses. And then uh, on our Wednesday evening service, when we, when we walked through the book of Acts especially, Spiritual gifts, in particular, are those that are given to us uh, at the Lord's pleasure and through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they come at the moment of salvation. And, of course, the Holy Spirit is a gift from God who indwells us at, as New Testament believers at the moment of saving faith. And along with the Holy Spirit, we receive a spiritual gift or gifts. Now, those gifts may work in tandem with our, with our natural talents. For example... Um, our, our choir started practicing back today, and, and they're, they're going to be back up on the platform next week, and that'll be great. But musical talent is, is an excellent example of this. Musical talent, uh, you, you don't have to be saved to have musical talent. All kind of people have musical talent, but the gift of ministry, the gift of service, as, as it's often mentioned in the, in the King James, you may be given that at, at salvation, and that causes you to want to use your talent in a way that, uh, that not for the applause of men and not so that men can praise you, but so that others may receive ministry and God receive the glory. And uh, that, that's the difference. It's not because we're doing it for the applause of men. And I'm not saying that applause itself is wrong unless you're applauding for the person. You know, when, when we applaud after a special or something like that, it's not just because we think that person's really cool. It's because we're magnifying God for the truth that was just sung. Amen? That, that's why sometimes, depending on the song, uh, I, I don't necessarily clap, um, you know, but, I, uh, but I just put my hand over my heart and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, if you're looking at me up here on the front pew and you say, oh, well, uh, Gilbert didn't clap there. He must not have liked that person be be because it's not about the person, right? Are you all following me or not? It's not, about the, it's not about the performance because it's not a performance. It's a minute. I'm not performing for you. I'm not dancing for my supper tonight. This is what God has called me to do. And whether you're sinning or preaching or, 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 or working in some or ministering in some way, that's not as noticeable. It's the same thing. And it doesn't mean that you don't have a natural ability for that. You know, so uh, uh, you may have a natural ability in a certain area, but when God saves you, he could gift you in a way so that you use that natural ability in a very specific way for the, for the glory of God. That's just one example. There are others, but we don't need to belay that. In the case of Saul, there were some, there were some strong natural leadership characteristics that he possessed but God gifted him supernaturally to do what was required of him uh, as a king. And these, these gifts 
uh, came to him uh, supernaturally uh, in the form of some assurances that were given to him. So the, uh, that's why I want you to look with me in chapter 10, and we'll begin ver uh, in verse 2. There were some assurances that God gave him so that he could be assured of God that he was gifted and blessed to do this, uh, this ministry of leading the nation of Israel. And here was the first assurance. God will solve your problems his way. Now, I, I've, got it, I've got it listed this way because we're studying a man of history. We're studying something past tense. But, beloved, understand this. Just because we read and hear the, old, the, the Bible, old and new, in past tense, doesn't mean it's just for people back there, but this is truth for us in the present, right? Amen. And so I've got these assurances, because not only were these assurances for Saul, but these are assurances that we can claim ourselves. God will solve your problems his way. So look at verse 2. And uh, uh, um, Saul's immediate problem <laughs> were, these, were these missing donkeys. Uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 2. When thou art departed from me today, uh, then uh, thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou went to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of them, and sorrows for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? That's exactly what, what uh, Saul was worried about. The, the donkeys were back, but now Kish is saying, I got my donkeys back, but I've lost my son. And, and, he, and he's worried about that. So God will solve your problems his way. Now, please understand this. That doesn't mean, and you've heard me say this enough, you know, praise God for the truth that God will solve your problems his way. That doesn't mean we go in the hammock, put our hands behind our back, put our uh, sweet tea on, on the little table next to us, and say, ain't God good? And he's going to solve my problems, he's going to solve my problems his way. Yeah. Solving his problem, solving our problems his way involves us being obedient, diligent, uh, considerate, and teachable at least, right? Absolutely. But the thing is, we will do what we can do and trust God to do what only he can do. And that's always, that's always the case. God's will doesn't give a promise of the absence of problems. In fact, I would say just the opposite. Following God's will is going to guarantee you problems. It's going to guarantee you problems. Psalm 121 is one of my favorite psalms, and I'm going to turn to it so I don't mess up the quote of it, and there's no way I should. Mama, who was bred, born, and brought up in the shadow of Pine Mountain there in Letcher County, she always used to quote Psalm 121, especially verse 1. Um, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. The King James kind of uh, uh, punctuates this. It's, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. And then there's a question, from whence cometh my help? And here's the, here's the second verse and the answer. My help comes from the Lord, which has made heaven and earth. And so in Psalm 121, we're, we're reminded of the very thing I'm talking about, that we have the assurance. We have the assurance of two things in Psalm 121. We have, and here's what we all love. We have the assurance, verse 2, that God is our help, and as you continue on to read, he won't let your foot slip. He's, he's never going to sleep. He's your keeper. He's your preserver. We have that assurance. It's a great guarantee. But here's the other thing that's assured. So we have the assurance of God's protection, his pr preservation, and his help. And here's the other thing we're assured of. We need help, right? I look to the hills. Where's my help coming from? And that's the other thing. So Following Christ and, and never, never, never explain the gospel and talk to other people about the truth of God's word as if just trust Christ and your problems go away. And, and, and we can use that kind of language, and, and, that kind, and there is truth to that to a certain degree. So the weight was lifted off, and I felt so better, and, and all these different things. And that is true. But trust in Christ doesn't mean the absence of problems. It means actually the gain of a whole lot of problems, humanly speaking. But the thing is, we have our help that comes from the Lord, and so he won't let our foot slip. He's never going to go asleep. He's going to be our helper, our keeper, our preserver. 
He's going to solve your problems his way. It's not the absence of the problems, but the presence of the problem solver. Let me say that again, because I want you to own it. It's not, and don't look for an absence of problems, but look for and be thankful for the presence of the problem solver. And I think God was just calming the heart of Saul by, assur by assuring him that no matter what problems Saul might face, God was able to solve them. No problem is too big or too little for God. So 1 Peter 5, 7, remember that? It's been a while since we've been there, but 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon God, for he cares for you. Psalm 55, 16, as for me, I will call upon the Lord, and the Lord shall save me. Psalm 121, I will look up into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. So it may be that Saul was by nature a worrier. I don't know. It, it could be. I, I, I think when you read this, especially at this point in his life, Saul was by nature a worrier. Do you know anybody like that? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not trying to make eye contact in specific right now, okay? I'm just looking at you. I, I never do that. I'm just looking at the congregation, but I'm not, I'm not saying, do you know anybody who's a worrier? You know, I'm not doing that. But you know some worriers, right? And I think we can all be that way to a degree. Some of us, bless God, are just more worriers than others. And God is against worry. Take no thought, Jesus said. To the, uh, take no thought about what you eat or what you drink. Or, uh, yeah, I need to look it up. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 6. Take their... Take, therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's like we said this morning. Follow the path of righteousness, and peace is going to find you on the trail. Peace will find, and, and, and so will assurance, by the way. Worry, worry reveals a lack of faith. You know, I don't know that God's got, I don't know that God, God needs my help on this one. I just don't know about it. Worry reveals a lack of faith, and it keeps us from experiencing God's base, best. The second assurance uh, uh, of Saul is recorded in verses 3 through 4, and that's God's going to supply your needs, and again, he's going to supply your needs his way. So verses 3 through 4, Then shalt thou go on forward from hence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there they shall meet thee, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. Because remember, they're out of food. And Samuel had given them a good meal, you know, but they had to make their way back. And God is going to supply for their needs, and he's going to supply for their needs his way. Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God never has a cash flow problem. God never experiences food shortages. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has all the silver and the gold. It's all his. He will provide. He asks us to, he, he, not ask us, but he teaches us to pray that way, to pray for our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray daily for our daily bread and be satisfied with what God is providing. He will provide you with what you need. We need to be thankful for what he, what he provides and be content with what he provides. And then here's the third assurance. And we see that in verses 5 through 6. And that is the Holy Spirit's work. Now, I say the Holy Spirit's work. Let's just read it, verses 5 and 6. And after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, which is the, which, where the garrison of the Philistines is. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that... Thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with sal psaltery and tabret and pipe and harp uh, before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them and shalt be turned, turned into another man. And so Saul is promised that the Holy Spirit is going to do a powerful work in his life. And we have that same promise. We, now here's what's different between the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. And I'm, I'm going to say this, I, I always say this when there's things that, are, that, are, that aren't 
cut and dry in the scriptures where there can be honest disagreement between men and women who are, who are trying to understand the scriptures uh, as best they can. What I read, when I see, what I see when I'm reading the, the Bible, Old and New Testament, is a different operation of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit coming on the people of God uh, in, in the Old Testament and at times leaving them. And we're going to see that uh, with Saul. And David prayed, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me uh, in Psalm 50. Either Psalm 51 or Psalm 32, I forget exactly where. But David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Talk about this special work, this, uh, which you could call maybe an anointing, but this special work of the Holy Spirit on the life of a believer. Now, here's what we know from John chapter 14. Here's what we know from John chapter 16. Here's what we know from Romans chapter 8. And you can look up all those later. It's not my purpose right now to walk through all of that with you this evening. But we know from John 14, John 16, and Romans 8 specifically, just off the top of my head, that in the New Testament, post the crucifixion and resurrection, those, uh, these are Old Testament saints, Dave and the rest. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, when you're saved, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He just doesn't come on you for special occasions. But you, every believer, whether you're a child or whether you're an, an, uh, an elderly person in any age in between, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Your body becomes a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And if you are a believer... The Spirit indwells you, and He will never leave you. He seals you and secures you. Ephesians chapter 1, He is the earnest money, if you will, of our future glorification uh, 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 um, when faith becomes sight. And so we are, we, are, we are indwelt by and gifted by the Holy Spirit. As best I can tell, in the Old Testament, the working of the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit, but different interaction with believers. Jesus said, and in John 14, it, it, either John 14 or John 16, Jesus says uh, um, that, it, it, that if I don't go, the, the, the comforter won't come. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. And when I go, the Holy Spirit, will, and that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. And I just, I want to make that clear that uh, we have the, uh, Saul had the promise of the Spirit's work, and we have the promise of the Spirit's work, and the Spirit's work in our life is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, and His leadership and guidance, being filled with the Spirit in the sense of following His leadership in our lives. And as the prophet Zechariah says, not by might or not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's how all things are accomplished, Zechariah 4.6. Here's the fourth thing, we're, and we're about ready to land the plane. We're on approach right now. God is with you. That was the assurance in verse 7. You see it there uh, in verse 7? And let it be, when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. If you like, if you like to uh, mark up your Bible, mark up in the King James anyway, here's, here's how it's punctuated. And let it be, and then comma, I like that. And let it be. And then the last part, after the semicolon behind thee, for God is with thee. Let it be, for God is with thee. God is with you as you serve him. Hebrews 13, 5, the same promise that the writer of Hebrews repeats, that the promise that God made to Joshua, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Matthew 28, the, uh, the confidence that we have to fulfill the great commission that he has given us is, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So God is with you, and then here's the final assurance God will provide the people. Look at verse 26. We're at the end of 1 Samuel 10. Verse 26. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So what we skip there in between verse 7 and, and, and verse 26. Re remember that private coronation, that private anointing that had happened at the end of chapter 9 and into the start of chapter 10? Well, now that was publicly declared. And, um, and, and there, there, there were people 
that God had provided these people as he always does, whether you're a king, whether you're a pastor or whatever else, God provided these people who are all in, and they're all in from the very start. They're all behind the one that God has called to lead this organization, this nation, this people, this church. They're, they're a part of it from the very start. And there's always the people, too, who say, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. I don't know. And that Saul had that. Every, everyone has. But here's God's assurance. God, I'm going to provide people. I'm going to provide people who are going to be a part of, 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 of what you're doing. Um, you need people. God will touch their hearts and send them to you, whatever that need is going to be. Uh, God is going to give. Uh, you can't lead if nobody follows. I mean, you, you can have all kinds of leadership techniques, but if you look over your shoulder and nobody's behind you, then you're not leading anybody for whatever reason. And God, has, and God has given assurances to Saul and to us that if he's placed you in any kind of position of leadership, he's going to provide people who are going to follow. He's going to provide people who are going to follow. And he's also given assurances that, he's going to, that there are also going to be people who say, uh, not so much. <laughs> They're going to be there too. Um, but there's going to be people who are going to follow. And you lead. You lead as, as God uh, uh, outlines in his word. And so God's going, to give you, God's going to give us all that we need. He's going to solve our problems his way. He's going to supply our needs his way. He's, he, he's given us that salvation, the Holy Spirit, to indwell us. Uh, he is going to be with us, and he's going to provide the people that we need uh, to come around us, uh, to work with us, to labor with us for his glory. Uh, naturally and supernaturally. Our, our natural uh, abilities and, and God's supernatural giftings and leadership is what we see uh, when we talk about the people's choice here. It's a pity because this is, this is only the second study in the life of Saul. This is the first time that we've been introduced to Saul, and it's, it's, it's really good. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint. Next chapter is going to be the high point of Saul's leadership and Saul's, uh, and Saul's kingship, <laughs> and then it's all downhill from there. And, that, and so most of the lessons right now and next week we're having positive lessons to learn from the life of Saul. But after that, it's negative, and we need to learn from that as well. Take these assurances to your own heart and be thankful for them. Let's go ahead. I want you to uh, stand up with me. And once you get on your feet, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Our musicians are going to come, and we're going to close out this evening service singing together. And we're going to sing together one of my favorite hymns by Francis Havergal, Take my life uh, and let it be. And uh, that's a great way for us to conclude this service uh, as we talk about uh, learning lessons from the life of Saul and the assurances that he had, the same assurances that we have. So, Father in heaven, as we're about to sing, we've heard from your word and we've seen uh, the, the people's choice for King. And we see how you were a part of that, Father, as well. And we see how uh, Saul had a good start. And that should be a sobering reminder to each of us. Now, his, his fall and, and his end yeah, come at no surprise to you. You can't be a sovereign uh, God and be surprised by anything, Father. But from humanly speaking, we see this man who had a good beginning, you know, this obedient, diligent, considerate, teachable man uh, who started all, and had all these assurances from your word, just, uh, just like we have. So, Father, may we be faithful to follow after you, not comparing ourselves to others, not uh, being calculated with our obedience, but being all in in what you're doing and who you bring around us and what you're leading us to do, not for ourselves, but for your glory and for your goodness and for the furtherance of the gospel. And so as we're about to sing, I pray we sing it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we mean it that you take our lives and let it be consecrated wholly to thee. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. 597.
Hey, leave that up there for a second, Joe. That's, that, that's a great thing to sing, to end, and it's a great image to have in our minds as we're dismissed, that our voice and our lips be filled with messages from thee. Now, y'all tell me before we're dismissed, uh, how could our voice and our lips be filled with messages from God? How's that going to happen? Huh? You know, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to witness. That's what it means to have our, but how are we going to have his me message on our lips and from our voice? The Holy Spirit's leadership, that's exactly right. And, and, and what else? That's right, that's right. The Holy Spirit's leadership is never going to be apart or separate from this right here. And he grasps this into our hearts and our minds so that as you all have said, we can witness and communicate with our voice and our lips the truth of God's word which saves our soul, which is our assurance, and, it's, and will be the joy and the blessing of others. And so that's how, that's how our voice and our lips are going to be filled with messages from thee. If we are uh, uh, obedient to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's book. Well, let's go ahead and be dismissed. Hope to see you on Wednesday night. Shine and uh, GOE teens up in the Family Life Center. We'll be down here. We're going to be in Philemon. If you're following along with us, the next book after Colossians is 1 Thessalonians, but I explained why we're going to be in Philemon on Wednesday night, and that's where we'll be, oh Lord willing. Keep these prayer requests that we've mentioned before the Lord, and uh, hope to see you on Wednesday. Let's be dismissed uh, in a word of prayer. Brother Ronnie Arnold, would you close us in prayer? Let's pray